difference between faith and willpower. Faith and willpower. So Hebrews 11.1 1 describes faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And Romans 10.17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what's willpower? Well, the definition of will is the faculty by which a person decides on and initiates action. To decide, bring about, or attempt to affect, or bring about by an act of the will to purpose, determine on, or elect by an act of will. Oftentimes, willpower is talked about as something that we have to abstain or have self-control, but it really also refers to our firmness of purpose or will. And in psychology, they tell us that willpower is having that determination and self-control. So a, a lot of times people think that when we're talking about doing something by faith, we're just trying to make something happen with our human will, but then calling it faith. But Faith isn't something that can be drummed up, created, forced out of our own strength or ability. It's, it's actually a spiritual force. So it's a spiritual force that reaches into the spiritual realm and then brings into the natural or the physical realm what God has promised and intends for us. So even when we know what faith is and understand where it comes from, we can often be mistaken about whether we're acting from a place of faith or relying on our willpower to accomplish what we believe to receive. It's important to keep in mind that faith doesn't really create anything. It's the firm, reliant trust and expectancy in what we know to be true without evidence. Our willpower is what takes that faith, converts it into action, and forms the creation. So there are a few defining points that separate faith from will when we're thinking about this. Faith comes from God. Willpower comes from human determination. Faith is trust in God's ability. And willpower is trust in self. Faith is a spiritual force. And then willpower is more of the human effort. Faith never fails. Willpower can. And faith perceives truth without any physical evidence. Willpower is a decision of personal commitment. But the dance between faith and willpower is where the magic happens. So it's our will to be victorious and the power within us to express the greatest that forms willpower. In other words, willpower is what leads us to be victorious in our faith. It's our faith in our God-given and intended ability to express the greatest within us, that inner knowing of what we're really intended to become, that gives us the blueprint our willpower needs as a guide. It's the faith in our future self, our real self, that provides the template for willpower so it has a destination or a goal to work toward. Amoria said in the Chila on the Path, Letter 11, volume 18, number 11, from March 16th, 1975. We come with the fire of God victory that is a cosmic momentum of wisdom flanked by willpower and love power. We come with the fire of God victory that is a cosmic momentum of wisdom flanked by willpower and love power. He goes on to say, I have watched the chilas who, quote, know the law. Yes, they can recite sacred scripture, for as Jesus said, in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. There are, the, <clears throat> there are those who always, <clears throat> excuse me, there are those who always know the word. They quote the quotable quotes. They paraphrase the ascended masters. They're revered by other chilas on the path, yet in their lack of true understanding, they lack the thrust of action, the will to be victorious, the love to be self-sacrificing. And so they cycle and recycle the ancient wisdom going over and over the grooves of memory of the laws of God, not knowing that they are devoid of the spirit 
the grace and the fulfillment of the Lord of being. So we see here it's possible to have faith that we don't put into action. And as the book of James says, faith without works is dead. Now, what use is it, my brothers, for a man to say he has faith if his actions do not correspond with it? Could that sort of faith save anyone's soul? If a fellow man or woman has no clothes to wear and nothing to eat, and one of you say, good luck to you, I hope you'll keep warm and find enough to eat, and yet give them nothing to meet their physical needs, what on earth is the good of that? Yet that is exactly what a bare faith without a corresponding life is like, useless and dead. If we only have faith, a man could easily challenge us by saying, you say that you have faith and I have merely good actions. Well, all you can do is show me a faith without corresponding actions, but I can show you by my actions that I have faith as well. To the man who thinks that faith by itself is enough, I feel inclined to say, so you believe that there is one God, that's fine. So do all the devils in hell and shudder in terror. For my dear short-sighted man, can't you see far enough to realize that faith without the right actions is dead and useless? Think of Abraham, our ancestor. Wasn't it his action which really justified him in God's sight? when his faith led him to offer his son Isaac on the altar. Can't you see that his faith and his actions were, so to speak, partners? That his faith was implemented by his deed? That is what the scripture means when it says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. And of course, we know that our beloved El Morio was this Abraham who set the early example of putting faith into action through his willpower. The scripture in James 2 goes on to say, a man is justified before God by what he does as well as what he believes. Rahab, who was a prostitute and a foreigner, has been quoted as an example of faith, yet surely it was her action that pleased God. When she welcomed Joshua's party and got them safely back by a different route, yes, faith without action is as dead as a body without a soul. Khalil Gibran poetically described faith as, quote, a knowledge within the heart beyond the reach of proof. And what is the knowledge within the heart beyond the reach of proof? It's that knowledge of who we're intended to be. Bard T. Spalding writes in The Life and Teaching of the Masters of the Far East, Volume 1, page 66. Just as the mustard seed, although it is among the smallest of seeds, has the faith to know that within itself, it has the power to express the mustard plant. The greatest of all herbs, for when it is grown, it becomes a tree, and the birds may come and lodge in the branches thereof, just as a seed knows that within itself, it has the power to express the greatest, so must we know that we have the power within ourselves to express the greatest. In giving this parable, it was the quality instead of the quantity of faith that Jesus referred to. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, and that faith becomes knowing, Ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Just so is the frailest poppy seed and the mightiest banyan tree, the bulb, the plant, the tree seed, all know that they can express the greatest. Each has an exact picture of representation of what it must express. So must we have an exact picture within ourselves of what we desire to express. Then there must be an inner perfecting wrought by hourly preparation, and this perfection will come forth. No flower ever bursts into full bloom without perfecting this inner urge. A moment before the bud was confined within the sepal sense of self, but when this inner perfection is complete, the flower bursts forth beautiful. 
as that seed falls into the ground, must first give forth from itself in order to grow, develop, and multiply, so must we first give forth from self to unfold. As the seed must first burst its shell in order to grow, so must we burst our shell in order to grow. So what must we burst our shell of limitation to begin our growth? When this inner perfection is complete, we must come forth beautiful, the same as the flowers. Isn't that lovely? He also writes, consider the faith represented by the mustard seed. It comes to us from the universal through the Christ within, which has already been born within us all. As a minute speck, it enters through the Christ or superconscious mind, the place of receptivity within us. Then it must be carried to the mount or highest within us, the very top of the head. It is held there. We must then allow the Holy Spirit to descend. Now comes the admonition. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. Think. Does the meaning come? Heart, soul, strength, mind. Is there anything to do at this point but to turn it all over to God, the Holy Spirit, and the whole I spirit in action? This Holy Spirit comes in many ways, perhaps as the tiny entity is tapping and seeking admittance. We must accept and allow this Holy Spirit to come in and unite with the minute point of light or seed of knowing and revolve around it and adhere to it, just as you saw the particles of ice adhere to the central particle. Believing something is possible is always what precipitates us in realizing it in the physical, right? So musicians often hear music in their head before they write it. Artists will see a painting in their mind's eye before they go out and paint it. Entrepreneurs imagine a company and its purpose, and then they bring it into being based on that. And so we too are tasked with clearly picturing our realized self with a capital S and then bringing it into being from that inner knowing, that faith. I recently watched a documentary about this American rock climber. He was a prodigy. His name was Tommy Caldwell. And he was an amazing example of someone who believed something impossible might be possible and then found a way to do it. So Tommy is this free climber who, which means basically they don't use a lot of aids. They do tie themselves off to be safe but they basically just use their fingers and their feet and their determination, their athleticism and some chalk on their hands. And he lost his index finger in an accident. After that, everyone said, there's no way you're gonna climb again. And he was determined he would. And so he figured out how to climb without missing one of his index fingers. And essentially um, not only did that, but went on after his marriage fell apart, he just decided he had to climb the Dawn Wall of El Capitan in Yosemite, Yosemite National Park. So the Dawn Wall is a face of El Capitan that's essentially the smoothest and the hardest to climb. It's 3,000 feet tall, which means the Empire State Building stacked three times. And he decided, even though no one had ever climbed it free, free form this way, that he was going to find a route. And he took six years and kept mapping out little sections of the wall, bit by bit by bit, finally figured out how to connect all of these little puzzle pieces and decided he was going to try to go to the summit. So after six years of plotting his course, he brought his climbing partner, Kevin Jorgensen, with him, and they took this historic ascent to the top of the summit that took them 19 days. So that means that for more than two weeks, these two were climbing, sleeping on the side of the mountain, tying off and staying in these, you know, tiny little tents on the side of this huge rock face. Um, ice was falling on them. There was wind blowing, you know, and it was sort of terrifying to watch, honestly. But they were so determined that they were going to make it that even though there was a moment where they it looked like Kevin wouldn't make it as well, um, Tommy went back for him. And 
eventually they made it and it was it was watched by the the news media it was global for anybody that was following rock climbing or sports everyone sort of was in awe of of what he was able to do um and then you take into account on top of that the missing index finger is just remarkable and so tommy basically did what no man thought was possible but he knew it was possible he knew within him he could do it and his faith and determination is really what helped them both including kevin to do the impossible. The writer Charles Bukowski would have been really proud. Um, in fact, Totem, he famously said, if you're going to try, go all the way. Otherwise, don't even start. This could mean losing girlfriends, wives, relatives, and maybe even your mind. It could mean not eating for three or four days. It could mean freezing on a park bench. It could mean jail. It could mean derision. It could mean mockery, isolation. Isolation is the gift. All others are a test of your endurance of how much you really want to do it. And you'll do it despite rejection and the worst odds. And it will be better than anything else you can imagine. If you're going to try, go all the way. There's no other feeling like that. You'll be alone with the gods and the knights will flame with fire. You will ride life straight to perfect laughter. It's the only good fight there is. This is the kind of willpower that the masters want us to have in realizing our faith. In the same letter, El Moria said, victory is a light, a being, a consciousness. Victory is a flame whereby the collective will to failure focused in the subconscious of the race as a negative spiral of defeatism is inverted, overcome, and reestablished as the ascending cycle of the soul's reality. Victory is a magnetic momentum that builds the mountain of self, which becomes the magic mountain of ascended being. I have watched the chilas who, quote, know the law. Yes, they recite sacred scripture, for as Jesus said, in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. There are those who always quote, know the word. They quote the quotable quotes. They paraphrase the ascended masters. They are revered by other chilas on the path. Yet in their lack of true understanding, they lack the thrust of action the will to be victorious, the love to be self-sacrificing. And so they cycle and recycle the ancient wisdom going over and over the grooves of memory of the laws of God, not knowing they are devoid of the spirit, the grace, and the fulfillment of the Lord of being. We come with the fire of God victory that is a cosmic momentum of wisdom flanked by willpower and love power. We come with a cosmic threefold flame to infuse knowledge with life, to confound the wisdom of this world that is foolishness with God, to transform that wisdom by the power of his rod. We come to blaze the threefold action of the law that swirls as resurrection's fires through the brain, the mind, the consciousness, the heart of the chilas, the world around, who would as one body, one flame, Form the spire of victory. We come in the name of the Christ, in the name of Jesus, by the authority of God, we exercise the quarters of consciousness. We command in the name of the living God all discarnates, all fallen ones, and the splinters of divided unreality to come out from the temple of our God, to come out from the citadel of the Chilas consciousness. We come to purge the cinders of the mind, the ashes of the burnt offering of selfhood. We come to sweep clean that place that is prepared to be the dwelling place of the Most High God, the individuality, individuality of man and woman. Victory is the momentum of your ascension. Victory is the light of mercy whereby you forgive and forgive to the uttermost the soul's identification with the synthetic self. Without dalliance, without defense, the soul summoned by the Christ comes forth to make itself 
an acceptable offering unto the spirit. O oh, chilas of the sacred fire, the winners are those who have the will to win. And the consciousness of failure is the consciousness of doom. Let it be shattered and let it be cast into the sea. And the sea as mother flow shall absorb mankind's collective will to failure. And as the light of victory streams through the bouncing surf, the tide of a mother's love, fiery energy and motion, transmutes the fog of depression, the vanity of ego expression, and all not self-awareness outside of the fiery core of our oneness. Victory is the armies of the Lord marching toward the center, approaching the Arc de Triomphe in a radial pattern from the battlefield of life. And upon the tomb of the unknown soldier, the flame that marks the place where the lesser self has laid down its life for the greater self, let the testimony of the overcomers be written. These are they who love not their lives unto the death. Sheila's of the word who overcame the accuser of the brethren by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. St. Francis was outspoken in defense of the Christ light. By espousing mother poverty, he made the impoverished self the backdrop for the appearance of the Christ in an age fattened by self-satisfactions, indulgence and in carnal pleasure and carnal treasure. Will you do the same? Will you be the fiery cross of the convergence of Father, Mother, God? Will you place yourself at the nexus to be the witness of the bursting forth of the light and the identity of the eternal Christos? Today, the light must shine forth into the darkness of a world now bloated with the pollution of pride. The universal light streams forth. The light shines on the darkness and the darkness comprehends it not until man and woman make personal that light by determining to be the Christed ones. Then the personality of the Christ revealed as a living example will be understood and emulated. Come forth now, brave Chilas. Show the biceps of warriors bold. Show your expertise in wielding the sword of living flame as you go forth to slay the dragon of the lesser self. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. This record from the book of life is set forth in the revelation of Jesus Christ, sent and signified by his angel to John the beloved. It is the record of the one who lost the victorious sense, lost the flame of victory, and fell into the vain glory of the pseudo personality. And the glamour of that synthetic self is the dragon's tail that drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Thus, the misqualification of the energies of the lower chakras and of the mother flame, symbolized in the dragon's tail, caused many lesser angels to follow the one who was called Lucifer or light bearer, together with his lieutenants. Satan, Bilal, Beelzebub, Baal, and others. These demigods set themselves apart from the hosts of the Lord and the hierarchy of heaven. Having been cast out of heaven, they created their own kingdom of the underworld, commonly called the, fa the false hierarchy. Once they were privileged to serve the living God as his emissaries, but their refusal to worship the image of God the original matrix out of which the Lord God himself created the whole creation, including male and female as the positive and negative polarity of the divine whole. They were forced to descend into the plains of Mater. 
They lost their inheritance and their right to be joint heirs with Christ until they should bow the knee and confess that the light which lighteth every man and woman is not only the image of God, but the God of all. Therefore the warring went forth. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Having been vanquished by Lord Michael, prince of the archangels, these fallen ones became the prisoners of time and space, became corruptible, and entered the spirals of disintegration and death. Since the fall of the Luciferians, the Satanists, and their cohorts, they have determined that as long as they were doomed to die, the children of God should die also. For the fallen ones have but one fear, and that is to die alone. Thus the arch deceivers of mankind, by their divide and conquer tactics, have devised all manner of witchcraft, witchcraft and black magic to torment the children of God and to draw their energies into alignment with their negative spirals, their defeatism, their despair, their despondency, their will to fail. Now we look to the overcomers to challenge the enemy within and without, to expose the lie of the dark ones who seek to invade the mind and the emotions, creating moods and rationalizations. These arch deceivers of mankind continually masquerade as the true identity of the children of God. At every hand, they seek to convince the chiel on the path that his synthetic self is real. I say to you now, your synthetic self is nothing but the fabrication of the collective consciousness of the fallen ones known as the carnal mind or the antichrist. All that seeks from within to condemn, to belittle, to downgrade, and to tear you from the love of God. This, precious ones, is but the movement of the downward spiral of those who dwell outside the kingdom, the consciousness of our God. They have willed it so. Therefore, do not fall prey to their sympathies, for they would draw you into that spiral of self-destruction by the magnetic allure of their false personalities. They magnetize souls by the brilliance of their minds, which they've stolen from the mind of God. It's a perversion of that mind. It's the glitter of the carnal mind. These fallen ones continually present themselves as the saviors of mankind. These are, are the false prophets that come preaching the kingdom low here and low there. Believe them not. Follow them not, O oh, Sheilas of the sacred fire, for the living God has placed his kingdom as the consciousness, his consciousness as a sacred fire within you. Watch and wait for the fullness of the coming of the Lord as the law of your being. And do not accept the counterfeit creation. For they are the arch enemies of mankind who are without scruples. These are the living dead who desire only one thing. To draw the living into their camp. I am the light of victory. And I am the threefold flame of your Christ awareness. I am the champion of your overcoming. And by your word, which is the word of God, I stand in this life, this hour, to challenge every challenger of the citadel of your God reality, of your divine plan, and of the matrix of your soul. Call to me, and let us go forth arm in arm to join the hosts of the Lord. Look up and see the banner of mighty victory and his legions. Look up and see how God is the defender of the light of victory within you. Invictus, I am the eternal flame that bursts in the heart and burns in the heart of heroes and heroines of the ages. El Moria. What a gift. What an amazing gift. What an amazing lesson. I'd like us now to take this next part as a meditation and go into our hearts and find that original place where we can feel that blueprint, where we can see that seed, that 
intention for what we are meant to become and burst forth beautiful. And I would ask now for each one of you to find that place in your heart, go there. Hold true this sense of, of faith. Maybe go and find a memory of a place where you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt what you're meant to be, what God has intended for you. Find that most sincere feeling of love and faith and, and go there. And I will read to you now from the Chila and the Path, chapter 12, Chilas who become defenders of the faith. And here we're calling upon our beloved Michael. So let's picture him being overshadowed by El Maria and also by Archangel Michael, that he comes forth to cut us loose and set us free from any of this misqualified energy thought, the will to fail, that we would come into alignment now with that Blu-ray. And what of Michael, Prince of the Archangels, known as the Defender of the Faith? Michael, the name rings across the heavens like a resounding of the Liberty Bell. And the soul caught in the briars and brambles of astral configurations hears the cry of deliverance. Hail, Michael, Archangel of the Lord, radiantly arrayed in blue-white lightning and the yellow diamonds of illumined action that crown this sun of light with victory. The dawn cometh, and over the hills there can be seen in the early light the silhouettes of the hosts of the Lord, legions of Archangel Michael, their shields reflecting a cross of white fire, their swords of living flame drawn in tribute to the mother. Swords formed of the sacred word which they intone, fired out of the vowels of their love for the living God. And they are joined by the twelve legions of angels who gather at the command of the faithful and true, who also wield the sword of Christ, focus of faith, hope, and charity. Chilas on the treadmill of life, yoked to the oxen of a mechanized Taurus substance by the lines of your own karma, look up. The deliverers of mankind are at hand. And Michael, prince of the archangels, leads the archangels and their legions in defense of the Christ consciousness. For God has ordained the evolution of the light through an infant humanity, as that humanity reaches up to be the full expression of the seven rays of Christed awareness. Chilas of the sacred fire in this hour of compelling victory, when victory's light surges from within and demands an outlet for the flow of love, I say, respond to the call from within. Respond to the mandate of the inner law of your being to be the fullness of the Christ, God victorious, love enthroned, crowning king and queen, while father, mother, God, ensconded in living flame, cradle the Christ child of their heart's oneness. And the fusion of that fire is for the mastery of the Christ consciousness in one of the seven rays. This day I say, choose the path of your appointing and of your anointing. Apply to the inner law of your being and affirm God reality as the cloven tongues of the Holy Spirit converge within you from the march to the summit of life's victory. You have heard of the Chohans of the rays. Now I say, invoke the momentum of the seven archangels to amplify in your soul and in your desiring to be whole the feelings of God, which compel the entire consciousness into conformity with the geometry of selfhood. The seven archangels wield the power, the wisdom, and the love of infinity, of a cosmos yet to be born within you, as the microcosmic, macrocosmic energies converge to become the warp and woof of the creative life force. Now expand the cup of consciousness to contain the archangel of your ray. If you serve the will of God, then on the blue ray, the first ray of the morning light, you define the azure of his holiness. The one who stands before the altar of the Lord, the adoring and the adored, 
releases into the consciousness of the archangel of the first ray in sacred ritual, a sphere of the will of God, a disc of flaming blue, a core of sapphire yod. Into his heart, the great archangel absorbs an atom of energy, a globule of light. And rising from the altar of the Lord, he goes forth into the cosmos to release the cycles of God's faith, the will to be, the courage to live gloriously, the honor of the law of life itself, and the energy to sustain a cosmic pulse. In this blue fire flowing, received into the chalice of the mother, is the blueprint of every form of life, the divine direction for fulfillment, the network of a cosmos, and the egg and the eye. And all the archangels and the seraphim and cherubim bow before the radiant wonder of the world. Archangel Michael standing in the center of the sun, now become a sunlit sphere of blue, haloed with the white-yellow brilliance as the diamond-shining mind of God exalts the warrior tried and true. Sheilas who would become aflame with faith, devotees of the will of God, who would become more of self as the selfhood of his will, look up. Behold the captain of the Lord's host, the great exemplar of your faith and your ray. And now, by invocation to your own I am God presence, submit by free will edict of your soul all doubt and fear and every hesitation, all resistance to action that formulates the human question and factors of disobedience to the word of the Logos. Submit them all to the conqueror. He, by the magnet of his love, takes into his heart fires and response to the fiats of the chilas, all substance of negativity and the void of relativity. As these energies cycle through the blue diamond of his heart's altar, the flaming sphere of blue is returned to you and you and you. This Archangel Michael has done as a mighty work of the Lord for peoples and nations and continents and worlds. Carrying the banner of the cosmic virgin, he stands and he has stood down through the ages to defend the children of the mother against the dragon Tiamat and her seed. Now then heed our call and heed this sacrifice for the Holy One of God stands before you. And as you read, each chila of the sacred fire receives the visitation of the electronic presence of Michael, the archangel. Once you receive him in grace, in honor, and in thanksgiving, once you bid him enter the citadel of your being and offer unto him a cup of light, a cup of goodwill, while well, your Christ self offers unto him the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, let your soul not tarry in the shadows, but let it come forth and present also upon the flame, upon the altar of his flaming selfhood, all hopelessness, faithlessness, acts of wanton selfishness, and every careless deed. Allow the flaming one to assume the substance of your sin. Allow him to exchange it for the energies of his will to win. He will take unto himself that substance misqualified and transmute it into light, shining light, brilliant victory faceted in the mind of God. And so you lay the coals of a dying world of selfhood upon the altar of Archangel Michael, and you watch as before your very eyes they are transformed into the diamond of your crystallized Christ identity. This is the alchemy of the first ray. This is the movement of a mighty ocean that is the power of the will of God to suddenly be still and become the drop of individuality. Moria.
Won't you join me now in pleading to El Moria for his help and being victorious and reconnecting with our faith deep within and actualizing that faith? Oh, beloved Moria, thank you so much for this teaching and for all that you offer us. Thank you for overshadowing us and giving us direction and that will to win. Please come forth now and help us rediscover this will to be victorious, this power within us to express the greatest. Give us this willpower together. Help us rediscover our faith and our God-given and intended ability to express the greatest and to picture within us what we are intended to outpicture without. Please help us reunite with that knowledge within our hearts that we are indeed, we are that ideal and help us become it. Amen.